So on the 7th of September 2016, midway into the London Shivan Temple's two-week annual festival, the evening ritual was ritual was in full swing. The ritual cleansing, feeding and adorning of the deities had taken place and the moveful deities of Shiva and Parvati were being processed around the interior of the temple in the second circumambulation of the day. Three quarters of the way around the temple, the double reeded Nadaswaram and Tabal drum led, led the procession, stopped midway to perform a concert for the deities. Although playing almost consistently for the ritual, this was an opportunity for the deities and musicians to enjoy virtuoso musical performance rather than just fulfilling their ritual role in auspicious music. The concert lasted for approximately 10 minutes and it's an important part of the ritual um, and it's, it's considered that the deities respond kindly to musical performance and more likely to inhabit the ritual space. As the, duo, um, as the duo continued to crescendo with the increasing complexity of their music and the onset of bhakti viravakam, a kind of an overflow of devotion and atmosphere of spiritual transcendence, the temple president walked into the view of the musicians, looked sternly at them and gestured with his arms to reduce the volume of the music immediately. During the festival, residential neighbours of the temple had lodged complaints about the noise emanating from within. Although this was sacred sound inside the temple, it had been described as noise pollution outside. Shortly after the musicians reduced the volume of their music and concluded the concert, I joined several devotees to sing a number of songs to complete the evening's Pooja ritual. The songs evoke the sacred geography of South India and Sri Lanka through explicit references in the songs themselves. For instance, the 8th century song Pitta Pyore Sudi evoked the landscape of Vipurum in Tamil Nadu and describes Shiva in his dwelling at Tiruvannamalai Temple, which rests on the southern banks of the Penna River. Once the sounds, music, and actions of the puja had finished, the sacralisation of space during the ritual water game became profane, and the devotees left to return to their lives in London. So this anecdote usefully introduces several themes that um, I'm going to look at in this paper such as sonic theology and sonic ideologies in diverse urban environments such as multicultural London, as well as the centrality of the landscape and sacred geography of the Tamil homelands evoked in the performance of Tamil devotional songs. So in this paper I explore music and everyday space making through musical practices based in the London Shiva Temple. I briefly discuss Tamil and Hindu concepts of sound, music and space before exploring an epigraphic example reflecting the centrality and entanglement of music, space and geography in London's Tamil diaspora. The singing practice I explore here can be described as a type of sung or metaphorical pilgrimage through its evocation of networks of pilgrimage sites. And through such performances I argue that multiple spaces can be experienced in the temple and through the performance of song parts. These songs and musical and ritual practices are also vital in diaspora settings as a way of connecting across diasporas, so across transnational space. So many of the devotees at the London Shivan Temple have resettled in London as a result of the displacement of thousands of Tamils, people from the Tamil linguistic group, from Sri Lanka from the ninth, late 1970s. Sri Lanka went through severe ethnic tensions in the 20th century, which escalated to a vicious, almost three decade long civil war between the Sinhalese government and the Tamil rebel group, the LTTE or Tamil Tigers. In 1983, the anti-Tamil riots of Black July resulted in an ongoing mass forced migration. The Tamil diaspora is highly dispersed or scattered across the world, as many musicians and devotees describe it, stretching from India, Southeast Asia, Australia, North America to the UK and other European nations. For many of those displaced and scattered, the temple is a centre of life space, according to Fred Kofi and participating in temple rituals and other events, such as Parnatic or South Indian classical concerts, dance shows, and supplementary Tamil community schools is a means of diasporic emplacement for those who have been put out of place. In Hindi philosophy, nadam, or sound, is a fundamental of space and existence, while sound itself is considered to have power in the world. Nardum is a term to designate the absolute, the power underlying creation manifested as audible sound, 
Whilst music is a means of acquiring and expressing power, it's also a method for achieving supreme bliss. The importance of sound is evident in the puja rituals that take place in the London Student Temple. The ordered yet heterogeneous layers of sound are vital for completing the ritual and consist of Sanskrit chants, ringing bells to dispel evil spirits and invite the gods, ritual music making, singing, and a collective explanation of Om, the mantra of all the entire universe. The importance of sacred sound in and as sacred space relates here to Guy Beck's theory or his term sonic theology in highlighting the importance of sacred sound in religious practice and shifting scholarly attention from the visuals of religion to its sound. Furthermore, sacred space is considered more um, important than sacred books in Hinduism by some scholars, demonstrated in the centrality of sacred geography and rituals of pilgrimage. So this kind of this entanglement of music and space in the temple is often illustrated to me. Many devotees don't separate the temple or the puja ritual from the music, and there's always confusion when I talk about the music of the Nalazara and Kavala and puja, and devotees think I'm referring to a completely separate, either classical music performance or something else, and not this auspicious music that is so much part of the ritual. So Yoshitaka Tarada explains that this auspicious music is often believed to be part of the sonic manifestation of the deity, and it makes the deity's presence immediate and real to worshippers. So this, this Nalazara and Kavala music for many devotees is simply another feature of the temple's sacred space, thereby revealing this kind of idea of sacred space as sacred sound. So following my initial anecdote, the temple is an interesting example of this kind of in intersection between music and space and geography. It also demonstrates Tamil categories of space. The Tamil concept of Akam, inside, and Puram, outside, originates from Tamil art, ritual, cosmology, and classical Tamil Sangam literature, particularly in reference to inside and outside of the self, and the distinction between home and the world. Akan poetry focuses on the matrix of familial relationships and the interior fields, and it strongly refers to home, kin, intimacy, sentiment, um, settlement, and well matchedness. In contrast, warm poems are centered outside the matrix of familial relationships. They explore the relationship between an individual and the world around them, and they connote the exterior field, the outside world, non-kin, uninhabited areas, and ill matchedness While these categories demarcate fields, different fields or spaces, they are highly permeable and cross over, particularly in the original setting of Tamil poetry. But they also extend beyond poetry to permeate a whole way of life. <coughs> And this concept can be useful as an analogy for music and diaspora space in London, particularly between private and public spheres, as well as between wider multicultural society and Tamil diasporic communities. Um, issues arise, however, when sacred sounds inside the temple and, and permeate outside and into the world. So once a year, an outside, an out, outside event is held in the form of a chariot festival, a display of Hinduism in the Lushan locality and is a historic famous outside space in the vicinity of the temple. For such an event to take place, permission has to be granted in, permission has to be granted from local police and authorities, and the local MP is invited annually as a special guest. Therefore, in a kind of secular or neutral public space, the event is a legitimate display in London's multicultural mosaic, rather than what could be considered as noise pollution and a traffic obstruction. The issue of sonic um, ideologies or negotiations between diverse publics with different ideologies about the ethical value of space, of sounds in public space, um, taken from Jim Sykes' paper, um, arise when sound permeates the Akam Forum of inside outside boundary. But music, however, is vital for the sacralisation of this outside space and the success of the festival. Like inside the temple, layers of sound contribute to the successful fulfilment of the chariot festival, or what John Jim Sykes refers to as sonic enchantment. Sound actively causing the fulfilment of religious requirements. So these sounds include Kavadi folk songs and dancing, followed by the Nala's Ram Tavel, that was inside before. Um, Sanskrit chants around the deity on the chariot, bell ringing, and finally, Tamil devotional songs with percussion accompaniment by the temple singing group. Sam 
sounds and music are therefore vital constructors of the space that defines and maintains diasporic cultural identities, particularly when they become visible in a pluralistic urban environment. However, this is mostly, these tend to be mostly be performed in inside spaces such as the temple. So in addition to this concept of space, sacred geography also manifests in a number of ways in music and in everyday experiences of space and place. By sacred geography, I refer to Selvin Peterson's explanation of the term that refers to the residence of gods in specific places and the resulting temples and sacred places in the Tamil country of Tamil Nadu and Sri Lanka. <coughs> sacred geography isn't particular to Tamil religion and culture, but place in terms of a specific location is, is argued to be fundamental here in a way that it isn't in other parts of India. So now I go on to give a, an ethnographic example or an ethnographic description of music space making the ubication of sacred geography at this particular site. So the London Sheevan Temple is in Lewisham, South East London, and contributes to London's multicultural landscape. Caribbean food stalls sit opposite Middle Eastern butchers, alongside Chinese doctors, Vietnamese nail parlors, and Irish community centres, to name a few examples. On the approach to the temple, one passes international banks and food outlets, the Sri Lankan um, restaurant and South Indian grocery shop, before crossing the small bridge over the Kogi River to stand outside the impressive Shivan temple. At eye level, the blue and cream building is decorated with sculptures of Nataraja, the very iconic Hindi symbol of the Kanti Shibu. Looking up from this image, there's an intricate Gopuram and Temple Tower. Usually punctuating the landscapes of rural and urban South India and Sri Lanka, but increasingly seen in, in, in areas with large populations of Sino Hindu diaspora devotees, the Gopuram visually indicates the presence of the Hindu community and the temple amid the Lewisham skyline. Each time I walk through the gates of the temple courtyard, I get a distinct impression of crossing into Tamil diaspora space not only through the visuals, but through the sound of spoken Tamil, the sounds of puja, and the bells of a classical dance class taking place elsewhere in the complex. So within the interior of this structure, three times a day, the songs of six to eight century Tamil saints echo around the interior of the temple. Standing in front of the temple, standing in front of the deities, Brahmin priests perform the ritual, the puja ritual, chanting Sanskrit mantras, offering flowers and oil lamps to the gods and goddesses. The Oliver Dandapani, a, a resident um, professional temple singer who's been hired from um, Tamil Nadu, then turns up the volume on his electronic Shruti box, Shruti drone box, sorry, and stands in front of the deity, with hands clasped in a prayer position, sings the Pancha Puranam Songpa, a set of five songs from what's considered as the Tamil Veda, during Mori verses. These verses were originally sung by Tamil saint poets who travelled around South India and Sri Lanka visiting shrines for Shiva, singing about their devotion to the god and the landscapes that surrounded them. I have a short video of this going on. Sound are sounded simultaneously 
Uh, so the, the music of the Tamil song, the ringing bells, the chants, the Nazvaram Tabal, which is normally a recording, which is one of the priests puts on the PA system, and the explanation of the Orm by devotees at significant moments in the ritual. Such layering blends together to create a vibrant sonic atmosphere within the temple and reveals sound and song as a central component of constructing ritual space. And thus, devotees create a favourable place for Shiva to dwell here or in London. As a result, to quote Andrew Eisenberg, sound thus becomes a material tendon linking sacred and profane realms, thereby transforming or sacralising the latter. But as Eisenberg goes on to emphasise the importance of people in this process, as he says, human beings also play an essential role in this sonic sacralisation of space. These songs um, reveal the centrality of music space and geography in everyday religious and cultural practice. Every time they're sung, a number of ritualised sounds and actions take place for them to have their full potential. For instance, every Saturday afternoon, diaspora devotees attend the temple to learn these songs. Some singers arrive early in order to pray to the deities ahead of the class as they sing these songs to create an intimate space between themselves and God. The class takes a very ritualised form. We sit in a semicircle on the temple floor and begin each class by consolidating our collective shruti pitch by singing on the Veda of One and Everything. Once our teacher indicates his satisfaction with our pitch, we raise our hands to the prayer position to sing a number of invocations to gods and to the saints who compose these songs. Following these invocations, to ensure the ritual space, the songs of the saints begin. The sequence of the songs progress in what I refer to as a song path for the conventionalised order of the songs which um, connect back to India and other diasporic locales within where they are performed. So the song path, I argue, takes, a, takes singers on a journey around the key Shiva temples in Tamil Nadu and Sri Lanka through descriptions of this landscape and geographical places in the songs themselves. So, for instance, in a um, in Enabunium, the text refers to the placement of the temple next to the river Kaveri in Valen Valchuri in Tamil Nadu. Um, what's the map here? These places. Um, Nirakara Aurangam describes the sound of the sea next to Konamamai Temple in northeast Sri Lanka. Similarly, Unamulai Umayya Lodam describes the mountainous and fertile landscape around the Anamalai Temple in Tamil Nadu. And Virutakundra describes the fragrance of the gardens next to the Roaring Sea in Mana, Sri Lanka, North Sri Lanka. Whilst these songs also state that devotees sing Tamil songs to find a higher place or a place of God. Um, Richard T. Jankowski argues that ritual music making creates virtual space in which multiple geographies of migration are created and reworked, and that musical roots of pilgrimage guide participants along these journeys of the imagination. In this case, the song path guides the pilgrimage and the singers direct the path of pilgrimage through their choice of songs. Through the song path and this evocation of sacred geography, devotees can cross into a virtual space in a similar way to worshipping at the physical pilgrimage sites in India Sri Lanka. These song paths then I suggest are a type of sung or metaphorical pilgrimage through diasporic performance, thereby reinstating the importance of these sites thousands of miles away from their site of performance in London. The individual and collective singing of this song path not only evokes networks of sacred geography, the sound of music entices okay. um, the sound and music entices God to enter the ritual space linking devotees in the material world to the immaterial realm of God. So sites of everyday diasporic music performance, such as the temple, therefore provide participants with the possibility to access multiple spaces and spiritual and geocultural encounters that are contrary to the outside wider society of these sites. This is predominantly through the performance of music and sacred sound. So I think these multiple spaces include the collective making of sacred space through music and sacred sound, whilst individuals perform songs to attain a shared space for God through the participation of a devotional act, the virtual space of a metaphorical pilgrimage through evoking networks of Tamil sacred geography through song, the remembered places of the homeland that are evoked through diasporic music making and ritual 
thereby reflecting Mark's Logan's statement that music is central to the diasporic experience, linking homeland and hereland with an intricate network of sound. And whilst such practices are largely unseen or un well, unintentionally unheard by the wider society in London, the construction or claiming of Tamil diasporic space is created through music, religion and material culture, especially during the chariot festival, which I referred to earlier. And finally, and I think this is particularly important for where my research has come to this point, um, this bridges across transnational space through the performance of music and ritual. So diasporic imaginaries are manifested through conventionalised music and ritual performance. And I think this, contribute, this contributes towards stretching across transnational space to connect diasporic localities in an act of what Tina K. Randerand refers to as multi-local belonging, um, a sense of common inheritance and relatedness that encompasses unknown members of a diasporic community around the world. So music for everyday space making is vital in this diasporic group in order to assess, access these multiple spaces and domains of experience. Issues arise, however, when the surrounding world is a diverse urban environment and tensions of sonic ideologies occur. Therefore, adaptations of everyday space making in the diaspora means that uh, music is rarely visible or intentionally audible outside the diasporic community. For musicians and devotees who have experienced displacement, musical practices become essential to emplace individuals to remap everyday lives and everyday spaces. So, as I've demonstrated in this paper, um, space and geography are intrinsic to dias Tamil diasporic musical and religious practices. Music is vital in everyday Tamil diasporic space making, whether in a temple described here or in secular venues around the city. I've discussed Tamil concepts of space and the issue of sacred sound in multicultural London. Through the description of musical performance in the London Shiva Temple, I've shown that music and sound is vital to construct sacred space, as well as evoke multiple spaces and sites of sacred geography. The entanglement of music space geography reveals that, in this particular example, music, sound, and diasporic space are co constitutive and spaces that define and maintain, and sorry, such spaces define and maintain Tamil diasporic identities in London. Thank you. Is there a uh, warm to pressing questions? Yes, thank you very much for a long presentation. Uh, uh, what uh, remains clear, at least for me, is what is the relationship of these sacred spaces made by Indian diaspora community mm. with the rest of the city? You know, is it open to the other or not? What is the relationship, relationship with, with, with someone, the other who is not Indian? Mm. Are there overlappings or? Well, I think the overlap is during the chariot festival when this kind of thing, this kind of music making and um, kind of sacralization of space comes out into the streets and it's kind of revealed to wide society. But um, I mean, I guess there's the un unintentional kind of overlap as well with music kind of emanating from inside the temple and that's what creates some um, tensions. Um, do you mean like? Is there kind of like a kind of exchange of kind of exactly. ideas and things? Um, to an extent, there is. Some temples are really keen on like bringing people in, but um, and this is this more broadly about musical performance as well. Um, one of the key points of musical performance, especially with the, um, classical concerts as well, is that in those kind of arenas, people want to speak Tamil, so that Tamil is still kind of still a spoken language in the diaspora. So. Although people are invited, it's not generally seen as a very kind of outreaching kind of musical performance because then they have to speak English and that will kind of just disrupt the whole dynamic of these diverse performances. Yeah. So I'm uh, yeah, regarding this not a cultural concept, literally living side by side with the society that holds them. I think in terms of music a bit more so, but not not in, in kind of just everyday kind of integration. It's they're very integrated, but this is kind of like just for them kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think we've got the rest of the